Good morning. You're very welcome to this one day seminar that celebrates Takabuti, the mummified ancient Egyptian who you can see on display in the Ulster Museum. Today, many of the researchers who contributed to the new book about Takabuti will share their research findings with you so that you will understand more about the life and the death of this young woman. So Takabuti was an upper class woman and she lived in Egypt during the 25th dynasty. She died when she was in her late twenties or maybe early thirties. Her body was mummified and she was most probably buried in the vicinity of the great religious center of Thebes, which is now modern Luxor. Her, her uh, mummy and coffin were then acquired by Mr. Thomas Gregg, who was a wealthy young man from Hollywood in County Down when he visited Egypt in 1834 probably as part of a grand tour. At that time, mummified remains were prized souvenirs and unfortunately, many Egyptian tombs were robbed for the benefit of wealthy European travellers. Now, thankfully, Greg donated the mummy and the coffin to the Belfast Natural History Society and thus began Takabudi's connection with Belfast and Northern Ireland. After much anticipation, she arrived on the island in the autumn of 1834 and she was the first Egyptian mummy to come to Ireland. She was unwrapped on the 27th of January 1835 and an in-depth analysis was undertaken on her body and the coffin by some of the greatest academic minds of the day. And since that time she's been a much loved part of the story of Belfast and has been a highlight of the city's main museums for many years. She was on show in the newly opened Belfast Municipal Museum and Art Gallery in 1929 and she's been associated with this site, which now is referred to as the Ulster Museum, ever since. She inspired paintings and poetry when she was unwrapped, but this inspiration did not stop there. And a further notable example of this creativity um, includes this oil painting, which you can see to the left. Um, which was created in 1880 by William Dara, who was the son of the curator of the Belfast Museum of the same name. And it was newly discovered to researchers during the course of this project. Uh, more recently, Takabudi had a chapter devoted to her in Bel Bernard McLaverty's 2006 collection of short stories, Matters of Life and Death. And curiously, she also made a brief appearance in the horror novel, The Undead of Belfast, by Tim Hodkinson, which was published in 2017. So using the latest scientific techniques, the Takabuti project has aimed to learn more about this woman during life, to discover what happened to her body in the aftermath of her death, and then to explore the story of her existence as a mummified ancient Egyptian displayed in a museum environment. So it's within this context of seeking new knowledge about ancient Egypt and making this available to both uh, researchers and the wider public that the Takabudi project was initiated and developed in accordance with all recognised ethical standards and procedures. The Takabudi project has had two main phases of activity. So one was in 2007 to 2009 and then more recently in 2018 to 20. So I'll now tell you a little bit about phase one before I'll pass on to Professor Rosalie David, who will pick up the story and introduce the work of phase two. So in autumn 2007, Ian Duggan, who you can see on the left of the, the bottom left photo, um, he was a director and a producer with Borderline Productions. Um, he sadly passed away in 2018, but back then he initiated a chain of events that would see his childhood wish of seeing the face of Takabuti become a reality. With the closure of the Ulster Museum in 2006 for a period of major refurbishment, Ian seized the opportunity to instigate a programme of research on Takabuti. And this resulted in a one hour documentary on BBC Northern Ireland, um, Show Me the Mummy, the Face of Takabuti. And this was first aired in October 2009. So to obtain as much information as possible about Takabuti during life and death, a team of experts were gathered from a range of organisations, including National Museums Northern Ireland, Queen's University Belfast, 
University of Manchester, University of Cardiff and the University of Dundee. <clears throat> so many of these original researchers have also been involved in the more recent research and it means that they've been able to update their initial findings. So in uh, the 2007-2009 research, it involved radiocarbon dating and stable isotope analysis in the Chrono Centre here in, in Queen's University, Belfast. An in-depth geochemical and morphological analysis of Takabuti's hair was also undertaken as part of a PhD project in the University of Manchester. A major component of the first phase of research was imaging analysis and this involved Takabuti being transported by boat and lorry to the Manchester Royal Infirmary where radiography and CT scans were taken of her under the guidance of the late Professor Judith Adams who you can see in the purple blouse. So the images taken at that time enabled more recent imaging analysis to be undertaken in 2018 to 20. In the earlier study, no cause of death was identified, and, but some good insights were gained about how she was mummified. So a mysterious package located in the top left of her chest, which you can see in the, the top picture to the right, was considered, um, was interpreted as the bandaged remains of her heart, because the heart was considered to be a vital element in allowing an individual access to the afterlife. So it was needed for the final judgment when the heart of the deceased was weighed against the feather of truth. So this interpretation seemed feasible and it was the accepted view until the recent examination of the images, which have resulted in a complete reinterpretation of the package. So one of the key aims of the 2007 to 9 phase of the project and Ian Duggan's childhood wish was to see how Takabuti would have looked when she was alive. And a focal point of the research and the associated television project was the production of a facial reconstruction based on Takabuti's skull. So when the Ulster Museum reopened its doors to the public in October 2009, the facial reconstruction was displayed alongside the mummy in a newly designed gallery for Egyptian antiquities. So I'm now going to pass you over to Rosalie who will complete this introduction. Phase two of the project commenced in 2018. Members of the team assembled in the Ulster Museum on October the 8th, 2018, for an intensive day of taking samples from the mummy. These samples of tissue, hair and bandages were taken so that a series of new scientific investigations could be carried out. Over the next year, the researchers processed these samples and the results were presented at a seminar at the University of Manchester on the 25th of January 2020. On this occasion researchers from phases one and two came together to share the new information. Two days later on January the 27th the 185th anniversary of unwrapping Takabuti was celebrated by revealing some of the new and exciting results to the public and by launching new display panels about this work in Takabuti's gallery in the Ulster Museum. The scope and overall aims of the project were expanded in phase two. New techniques became available and there was an expansion of the original team. Our aims were to finalise some of the details left over from phase one and also to address some specific questions. These included what was the nature of the package in the thorax of the mummy? Could any evidence of disease be detected in the tissues? What caused Takabuti's death? Was any further information forthcoming about her ancestry and ethnicity? And what could we learn generally about Takabuti's life in Egypt in the 25th dynasty? We have to ask the question, why are biomedical studies so important for us to understand disease, medical treatments and lifestyle in ancient Egypt, 
when so much other evidence is available? Well, with the art, uh, the funerary art of Egypt, the elite are shown as youthful, healthy and perfect in this art because the scenes were magically brought to life at the time of burial. And this was how the individuals would wish to continue into the next life. Sometimes servants are shown with afflictions or illness, but you can see in the slide on the right, uh, the ladies uh, seated uh, preparing for a banquet are shown in a very idealized way. Very occasional examples occur where medical conditions are shown. For example, in the left hand side, we have uh, the stealer of a man called Roma, who possibly suffered from polio, as you can see uh, in his, his leg. And in the center, there's a statue of Seneb, uh, a dwarf and his family. So here conditions which are uh, medical are actually identified, but they are very rare. Therefore, in the same way that the art is propagandist and not a reliable source of evidence for ill health, we have limitations with regard to the inscriptional and archaeological evidence. The medical papyri, you can see an example here on the right, the Cahoon gynecological papyrus, these contain treatments for a range of diseases. However, only 12 of them have been discovered covering a period of some 3,000 years, and there are problems with the translation of some of them. So they are a very incomplete source. The archaeological evidence, the, uh, the key uh, item is uh, the sanatorium here shown on the left in the Temple of Hathor at Dendera. Sanatoria were attached to temples, and this is where the sick were treated, particularly in the Greco-Roman period. However, since we only have this one virtually intact example, it's very difficult to draw major conclusions from this. So, scientific research on skeletal and mummified remains adds a wealth of crucial evidence about lifestyle, disease and medical treatments in ancient Egypt. The evidence from the mummies is free from the limitations we've described about the iconographic, inscriptional and archaeological sources. Takabuti would have believed that when she died, she would face the day of judgment when she would have to account for her behaviour in her life. The deceased person would come before a tribunal of divine judges and recite the negative confession, denying that they had committed any sins or crimes. If, however, the person lied, his or her heart would weigh against the feather of truth in the balance. And this is shown here in the right hand image in the papyrus belonging to a scribe named Annie. If the deceased passed this interrogation, they would go on to live in the underworld kingdom ruled by Osiris. He appears in this papyrus on the far right, and a wooden statue of him is shown on the left. After death, Takabuti would also have hoped to continue to spend some time in the tomb, surrounded by all her possessions. However, the Egyptians were well aware that the tombs were ransacked and robbed, often shortly after the burial. So this concept of eternity was always in jeopardy. As a kind of backup insurance, they asked that their names should be repeated and remembered so that they might continue to exist. And so, as we gather here today to discuss the life and times of Takabuti, it is perhaps appropriate that we are honor honouring her in this way. We hope you enjoy the discussions throughout the course of the day.